This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. This is my iron. You're going to acknowledge me. Welcome to the current state of WWE, everybody. It is Monday, November 7th, 2022. We've got Anthony DeMarco here with us to talk about Crown Jewel, and we'll hone in on a couple of topics, that being Logan Paul and the the Braun Strowman uh, Ali controversy going on online with the, the Twitter war going on. So, uh, first of all, Anthony, how are you doing, and how did you like Crown Jewel overall? I thought it was a really good pay-per-view. Was it the best? Obviously not, but I think that it was one, probably the only Saudi Arabia event where I didn't walk away with one match where I rolled my eyes. It felt like a legitimate, like it felt like this could have been a pay-per-view in the States. Maybe aside from the Brock and Bobby match, I think that was the only match that kind of felt forced and was only happening because they needed the big level match. But I mean, in a lot of ways, like I said, like, look, all the stories made sense. Most of the matches I came away okay with, even though there was some where I weren't like, that wasn't the biggest fan of. But I just think a lot of them made sense. There was a lot of long-term storytelling. There was some, you know, payoffs with probably Bianca and Bailey specifically. They started some storylines moving forward, probably with Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss. They furthered the Bray Wyatt stuff. I thought the Logan Paul Roman Reigns match overachieved it in almost every possible way. Just overall, a very solid pay-per-view. Like I think a B plus, A minus is exactly where I'd put it. Yeah, I'm about a B plus. I thought from a wrestling perspective, just in ring, even if you didn't know anything about the storylines, delivered. And yes, we even got a Bray Wyatt appearance that was kind of just a the same old, same old with Bray. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's it's now becoming a pattern of him coming out, pouring his heart out, being Bray Wyatt. And then now we have Uncle uh, Uncle Howdy coming out, well, coming out on the Titan Tron. <laughs> and it sounds a lot like Bray Wyatt's voice, which makes me a little bit scared. And I didn't want to make this a huge topic, but just quickly, what did you think of the Bray Wyatt segment? Do you think this is Bray Wyatt? It sounds like his voice now. It sounds like his voice, but I think that it was too obvious for it to be him, especially in a Bray Wyatt world. Like, I really think that this isn't Bray Wyatt. I think that this is – I'm guessing that it's Bo Dallas – because I don't think that, A, they would make it that obvious because nothing with Bray Wyatt recently is obvious. And I don't think that they're ready for Bray Wyatt to have just a feud with himself because eventually you want this guy to get back in the ring. And look, I'm OK with the slow build. I think the it's been an excellent storytelling. I think maybe a little bit starting to get a tad redundant and repetitive, but still I'm interested. But I just... I, maybe it's me hoping more than me thinking logically, but I'm really hoping here that it isn't just Bray Wyatt feuding with himself. And I just think that because that they've been so good at maybe keeping things under wraps with Bray Wyatt and not making everything so obvious, I don't think that they – I think in some way they're making it sound like Bray Wyatt. And maybe it is him doing the actual voice, voiceovers of the promos, but I don't think it is actually him. Because I don't think that they would make it this obvious when it has been so complicated with so many levels with everything else to do with Bray Wyatt. Uh, I'm with you. It got me concerned because it sounded exactly like his voice, just slightly modified. I mean, if it is, it probably is. (laughs) But if it, I'll just say that if it ends up being just another alter ego, I will be very disappointed. I don't think that's where they're going to go, but it didn't did raise a little bit of a a flag for me that it's like, oh no, like I I don't want that to be the case because you said how 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 the hell can he fight himself? I mean, you you can't. So um, the other thing with that, just one quick thing, is Alexa Bliss. I'm sure you saw it in her promo, or rather her interview, right before her tag team title match she the uh, that upside down moth or whatever the hell it is the bray wyatt symbol appeared on a tv screen in the middle of her promo and she seemed like kind of mesmerized by it very quickly and i was concerned it it does again another concerning thing for me is i don't want alexa bliss sucked back into this but did you think that this was just kind of a a wink to alexa bliss and the connection she had with the fiend or do you think this is something bigger that she's going to be brought into the fold if she he does form a group I'm hoping it's the former because I think that Alexa Bliss is a lot better now that she's back to being Alexa Bliss. Like I had a buddy over for the pay-per-view and he's kind of been more of a casual fan, 
But when he saw Alexa Bliss come out as Alexa Bliss, he said, man, it's so nice to see Alexa Bliss just back as herself after all this time. So I think it's I, I'm hoping again more that it's just, you know, creative, like just saying like, OK, we don't we don't completely unacknowledge. I said that very poorly, but we acknowledge that there is a history between Alexa and Bray and we're acknowledging. That And I think one of the things that Vince would do is that he would pretend that fans had short term memory loss or long term memory loss, that they just didn't remember anything other than what happened over the last couple of weeks. So I'm hoping that's more them saying, it's like, no, no, we remember that she was a part of it and she still is uneasy for anything to do with Bray Wyatt. But we're still going to move forward with this new version of Alexa Bliss's character. And the other thing, and I know that they have been very loosey goosey with the brand split, is that she is on. On Raw, he is on SmackDown. So, look, I'm not going to completely rule it out that it could be Alexa Bliss, uh, you know, going to join this group. But I'm hoping more that it's just Alexa Bliss just acknowledging that she does have a checkered past with Bray Wyatt. And they're just saying, like, look, we didn't forget, but she's get, she's still troubled around him. But we're not going to move forward with her going right back into, like, the Alexa playground stuff. Yeah, there's they can't, and fans got very tired of it towards the end, even the, as good as she was in the all-in role that she played it. Yeah, I agree. Um, so uh, let's talk. We'll get to the Braun Strowman Ali drama going on Twitter in, at the second half of this, but I want to dive into the uh, the main event here with Logan Paul, with Roman Reigns, and I'll toss it to you. Thoughts about Logan Paul's performance, crowd reaction, what, what was uh, on your mind? I think that Logan Paul, with each and every match that he has, it's always like the same formula. We get annoyed that Logan Paul is there. We get annoyed that he's being put in a prominent position. And then he has the match and we're just like, God damn it, this guy's so good in the ring. He's literally a natural. I don't think that anyone has transitioned as smoothly into professional wrestling as Logan Paul has. And look, is he kind of a D-bag in a lot of ways off screen? Is he kind of unlikable, as you mentioned, with the toothpick and his entourage and, you know, his social media and, you know, taking selfies or a video while he does a frog splash in the middle of the match? Yeah, all that is yes. But you cannot deny the char- char- charisma, easy enough for me to say, that he has or the in-ring talent that he has. And I think that Roman Reigns has slowly but surely just continued to get better here. The facial expressions throughout the match, him really selling the one lucky punch where he was checking like clearly that his his ear was ringing after the match ended, how he was just looking at Logan Paul like shocked that he had to push himself to that limit. And I think that just the the storytelling of, you know, Jake Paul coming down, obviously he's a real life boxer. I thought that he looked a little awkward in the ring trying to sell a fake punch. And I just thought that all in all, it was just very, very good storytelling on numerous fronts and look was this a one-off match was this primarily because they wanted a big name to be in the main event of Saudi Arabia of course but I think that compared to the past main events that we've seen in Saudi Arabia like Undertaker versus Goldberg or Goldberg versus whoever or DX versus Brothers of Destruction this is probably the best one that they've put together because yes did they bring in a guy who didn't deserve to be there and probably didn't make a whole lot of sense absolutely but that same guy came in here and put on an excellent match a great main event and just overachieved and i think that slowly but surely we're just gonna have to start accepting that you know what logan paul is gonna get priority placement because of the clout that he has on social media and the amount of eyeballs he's gonna draw to the product but at least we know that from an in-ring perspective the guy's gonna put on a very good match and he's taking it seriously Seriously, which is really cool to see. That was the number one thing for me is, is this guy actually taking it seriously? Is he putting in the work? And he is. Regardless of what you think about him on a personal level and what you've seen about uh, on him in the news or whatever, whatever you think about his personality, the guy has athletic ability that is that is, you know, in the top 1%, I think, of, of uh, nearly probably the, the world. And, and he's he's so good at in-ring and adapting to what he's been able to, at that level he's been able to perform at for only having three matches now. It is impressive. Now, you can have a great match, but that doesn't mean the crowd is going to still accept you in that spot. 
you know, just because you can put on that kind of a match doesn't mean that the crowd is going to cheer you, uh, especially if in the build up to the match that you're going to have. Look what happened with this. I mean, the the crowd, WWE didn't even want to put Logan Paul in, in front of an audience in the build up to this, which is a smart thing because he got booed any time that he did, one time that he did. So... I don't think that Logan Paul is going to be a baby face anytime soon that people are just going to gravitate and to and be able to uh, just relate to. And he's, you know, I, I can see myself in him. The fans don't organically connect with him. They look at him as a social media star that got, uh, you know, kind of handed this position because of his status, because of his 20 million followers. And I understand why WWE did that. I don't blame them. But I just think that even if he continues to put on these types of matches, that it's only going to take him so far before the fans are like, okay, yeah, we know what you can do in the ring, but like you still don't deserve to be here. It's going to be a battle in our minds as fans of, okay, he, you know he can perform at this level, which is higher than even some established stars that have been there for years, but th- is that going to supersede the fact that he still does not deserve to be in this position with guys that have been here for like five, ten years or more and have not gotten a, a championship opportunity? So there's going to be this struggle with fans of what is more of a priority, what matters more to fans, uh, but I give him all the credit in the world, and he got the fans behind him during the match, and I will say, I don't know about you, but the one spot in the match that I actually was looking for to believe, I did half-ass believe when he hit the frog splash on yeah. Roman on the outside. He had, he put Roman through the table, then brought him back in and hit another frog splash. I said, okay, like this could happen. Did that did that moment happen for you where you actually thought it could it was possible? Yeah, for sure. They got me believing because they already had the melee on the outside with the Usos, and then Jake Paul comes down to the ring knocks out the Usos, and then it's just like, man, like all the stars are aligning here. And look, I mean, in that moment, I really did jump to my feet. And it's also because he was like, it didn't look uh, like unorthodox in any way. Like it just looked so realistic that like he just kept hitting like these one lucky punches and like using his high fly mentality and Roman Reigns just not taking him seriously. And I think that that's the one thing that really sold this is that creatively they booked this match and told a story that was the most believable possible that the only way that he was going to come out victorious here was a by roman not taking him seriously and b by hitting a lucky shot once or twice in the match and that's the story they told and i really like the consistency of it and in terms of the other stuff about logan paul it's always going to be tough because i don't think at any point this guy is going to be a, a full-timer I don't think that he's ever going to be wrestling on every Monday Night Raw or at, you know, B-level pay-per-views or what have you. So you're always going to be in kind of a precarious situation where, like, he is a big-level star, so you want to put him in a substantial match, but you don't have that big of a track record to justify putting him in said match. So, I mean, at a certain point here, I think that people are just going to have to accept what he is and how WWE is going to use him. And that's a guy that he's excellent in the ring. He brings a lot of eyeballs to the product, and more times than not, if not always, he's probably going to be in matches that he shouldn't be in from a storyline perspective. And I don't think we've ever – I think this is uh, the absolute anomaly in wrestling where you see a guy with this much star power who has no history in wrestling but is so good in the ring – that I don't, I can't even relate it to anything or point out another example because I just don't think it's ever happened before. So I think that at a certain point, we're just going to have to just accept what he is and just be like, okay, he shouldn't be here, but because of his star power and because of his in-ring ability, I guess we just have to accept it. Yeah, there's going to come that point. I just don't know if they're going to try to book him as a heel or face because he could go either way because even if he's a heel going in, he's so good in the ring that fans start to cheer for him during the match because they respect how good he is. Uh, and the only example I can think of of anybody that came close in the last like 25, 30 years that I've been watching wrestling is Kurt Angle and how quickly he picked it up. Ronda Rousey's also kind of up there, up in the conversation too, to be to be fair. Um, but Kurt Angle to me, and I think I think even Triple H said that that he's never seen anyone pick it up as quickly as Kurt Angle did. But you know, Logan Paul, I, while he's not the athlete Kurt Angle is, he's not an Olympic gold medalist. But I think in terms of how quickly he was able to adapt to the style of, of WWE, it's impressive. And I think he's in the conversation with Kurt Angle in terms of that. So you know, more props to him. And, and like you said, I don't. Don't think either that he's going to be a day, a week to week, 
star that's going to be there. But I also think that's going to work against him if they're trying to get fans to cheer for him. Because if he comes in like a Goldberg and every single time that he's in WWE, he gets put in a main event. Like every time he pops up, he's just entitled to a main event like Goldberg. Um, I think it'll work against him being cheered. But I can see them bringing him in maybe four or five times a year right now. We don't know what his contract says. That's the thing. He's only had three matches. So if he can, you know, we'll have to see over the next few months, especially leading into WrestleMania, maybe he'll be there more. But how he, how often he shows up, we don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I enjoyed the match overall. It, it impressed me more than I even thought it would. And I was thinking it was going to be a really good match. They had me believe Jake Paul was there. Um, you know, his entourage was there. And uh, it was it was a good match. I, I have a really good match, and I have nothing bad to say about it. But I guess the next question to me is, well, number one, any final thoughts on the match itself with Logan and Roman? But also, Roman Reigns' next opponent, possibly for Survivor Series, because after that, we have nothing until Royal Rumble. Yeah, in terms of the match, I do like that it took one spear to... F- I'm pretty sure it only took one spear to close out Logan Paul, correct? In the ring, and- yes, yep. Yeah. And I really liked that, that as soon as Roman hit his finisher, like it was done and they continued and stayed consistent with the story and the narrative that like, unless it was a lucky shot or Roman, you know, not taking him seriously enough, Roman would have the match in the bag. And as soon as Roman said enough is enough, hit the Superman punch in the spear, it was one and done. So I really liked that because it did also drive home the point that you know what roman is the better athlete here and if he actually decides that enough is enough this is done in terms of where roman reigns is going next year look obviously we know that survivor series it isn't raw versus smackdown this year thank god and even if it was like what would roman fight himself because he is both yeah. champions right now so in terms of an, an opponent i mean they really haven't done anything in the way of building Roman Reigns, a next opponent since he was on the Logan Paul's podcast. And that was, what, two months ago, give or take? It was before Extreme Rules. So they really have a wide open option here. Like, I hope to God that he is actually going to perform at Survivor Series. Like, I I don't think they could afford not to have him at one of the big four pay-per-views. So I'm going to just assume that he is. Unless they decide to go with a traditional five-on-five Survivor Series match with Roman Reigns and the bloodline against a group of five guys. And I think that's the only thing that I could see them doing that would buy them more time to see who the next challenger is for his undisputed championship. I do think at some point they're going to try and get the rock in there. I know we've been saying that for what, two, three years at this point, but I do think they will start driving that kind of, or start at least planting the seeds for that sooner rather than later. And usually survivor series is the time where you start to see the Easter eggs between Survivor Series and Rumble. But at this point, I would not be surprised if it is a five-on-five match of the Bloodline versus a group of five guys. Who those five guys are, I'm not too sure. Like, I could see something like the Brawling Brutes, Drew McIntyre, and, like, Rey Mysterio. Like, I could see something underwhelming like that. I really, really could, just so they could buy themselves more time. Because I just, I don't have an idea. Like, Drew, been there, done that. Aside from Drew, like, are you going to jump into Bray right away? Like, Survivor Series is in three weeks from now. Or I think it's even less than that. I think it's two and a half weeks from now. Yeah. Yeah, so less than three weeks from now. I don't think that you could just jump in automatically to Bray versus Roman Reigns with less than a month of build to it. Like, that's a main event level match for a WrestleMania or a SummerSlam. So at this point, because of how little time they have to build the Survivor Series, I could see something like the bloodline against a group of five guys in a classic traditional five on five match. That's probably what's going to happen. I would agree. Uh, Don't forget, I mean, it's war games. So once if you have war games as the theme and you have two rings with a massive cage around it. Typically, the the match involves two teams of four or five, and they said there's going to be ten competitors in the match. They advertised that a few times at Crown Jewel. That would tell me that it's going to be a five-on-five, keeping a little bit in line with traditional Survivor Series, um, uh, I, I guess, tradition. But obviously, it's war games, so two rings, a steel cage. 
So that would tell me still, though, I think that you are right as far as the bloodline versus who. I mean, it could be guys from Raw and SmackDown. I would imagine that if it's just one match, you're going to have a compilation of Raw and SmackDown guys taking on the bloodline. Uh, But at the same time, maybe they do a free-for-all, and whoever gets the pinfall ends up the first pinfall or its elimination. Again, I'm just going on what they've done before. It's only been two teams, but maybe the winner of that match ends up getting an opportunity for Roman Reigns or at Roman Reigns. But it's in Boston, and it's, it, it is a big four pay-per-view. And you, I don't know how you don't have Roman Reigns there or competing, at least there, uh, and to make an appearance or whatever. So, And with, of course, rumored Sasha Banks coming back at, 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 uh, at War, or rather Survivor Series. That's another possibility, not to get off topic, but that's floating around there. But Roman Reigns has to be there, and I don't know if it's going to be two-on-two in terms of teams, or if it's going to be everyone for themselves in this 10 man war games match. But I think there's going to be big implications for who comes out on top here and what the consequence is. Like if it's two teams, I don't know what the consequence is. Like there should be something on the line, but you can't have Roman Reigns belt on the line with two teams. So I don't know if Roman's involved in a separate match or what the deal is. Do you think he'll be involved in this match? Or do you think he'll actually be involved in a separate match? Because you can't do anything with Roman in this for the championship, could you? I mean, I don't know. I'm hesitant to think that his championship will be on the line, to be honest with you, just because there's been no build. There's nobody. Like, I'm looking through the card right now, and, like, I mean, unless you pull something out of your your backside and like maybe it's like bring in a CM Punk or something or Cody Rhodes miraculously returns. But even at that, even if you had one of those guys at your disposal, like, is it enough time to build a match of that magnitude? Like, this is a big four pay-per-view. It's supposed to feel on par with SummerSlam and Royal Rumble, although obviously it never is, but it's supposed to. And I just don't know how you're going to like build a program that feels legitimate in less than three weeks. Like it's coming up very, very fast. So I'm honestly thinking at this point, and the other part about this is, as I kind of get sidetracked in seven different ways, is that most of the story development of the bloodline and the character development has been the, in, the interior conflict of, you know, the civil war type between Sammy and Jey Uso. So I think that if they're all teaming, in a in a five on five traditional match, you could further build that story as well, where you know Jay and Sammy are con- consistently at each other's throats, but now it's even more severe because Roman's in in the trenches with them. He's fighting alongside them. And look, the bloodline is five male athletes with Solo Sokoa and Jimmy Uso. So it, for me, because of how little time that they have to build to a championship match, because that there is no clear cut guy to challenge. For Roman's undisputed championship and I could see them saying something like Paul Haim saying like you know the tribal chief is not going to defend his championship two times inside of a month like this and that like for me and I'm not a fan of it because I do think at a pay-per-view like uh, Survivor Series the championship should always be on the line more times than not at least but I just feel like it's trending towards the bloodline against group X of five guys mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think we'll have a lot more. The next time we talk, we should know at least what the format's going to be. Maybe not everybody involved, but at least how it's going to be structured and what's on the line. Because, like you said, they don't have a lot of time to build this. They can't they can't dance around it and play coy for the next couple of weeks. They have to get right to it and tell us what's on the line and at least how the match is going to be structured at the bare minimum. So I, I think in the next week we'll have a lot more to discuss in terms of how this could play out if Rowan's involved, if his championship is somehow involved, if a number one contendership spot is on the line somehow. Like the, the, All this is just speculation until we know how things are going to be structured. So I think next week will be a, a easier way, an easier discussion considering we'll have more information. But um, let's let's close out the, the conversation here with uh, Braun Strowman and Ali. And the match that Omas and Braun Strowman, though, had at – at uh, Crown Jewel, I think it was a good match. It was, I think, as good of it as it could have been, given the size of these two men, and th- that they didn't have a flip flop and fly match, which was a a bit of a sticking point for Ali and uh, Braun Strowman. But I'll let I'll let you take the uh, the the, uh, the torch with this, so to speak, and explain exactly what's going on for those that may not know. So yeah, uh, Braun Strowman tweeted something out along the lines of. That, you know, him and Omos had a five star match and it just goes to show that you don't need to have the flip flops and flies to have a five star match. Ollie quote tweeted him by saying, can you 
teach me how to be released. And I don't know if that was a direct shot at Braun Strowman or if that's him saying that I'm just not happy here anymore, which he's been very vocal about for quite some time. And then Braun Strowman re- responded to his tweet saying something along the lines of, "Do you, are you, aren't you working in catering now? And look, I, I think that I've always been a Braun Strowman supporter because I think you need a guy like that in your company, whether it be a Kane back in the day or maybe not so much a Big Show because I don't think Big Show could work like Braun Strowman can. But to have a big man who is, yes, we get it, he is more or less one-dimensional, but to be able to work the way he does and the the shape that he's got himself into i think is a strong asset and then you have him go against omos which is obviously a spectacle match two guys that are absolute behemoths although it was very kind of striking to see how much omos actually towered over braun Strowman. that was quite a sight but i mean you see braun Strowman against omos and i would argue that was probably omos's best showing and yes for sure he's put in work by himself and i think he still is very green in a lot of ways, but I think that the fact that these two guys at their size and for a guy as green as Omos to put on a match as they did was pretty cool. And like you, I think you described it as a palate cleansing match. Like I still think that there's room for matches like this because I think that there are a lot of traditional wrestling fans and also old school wrestling fans and even casual fans that will be drawn to a match like this. And that's not to say that it could be an absolute tire fire. And I surely thought that this match had the potential to be, but I also think it showed that Braun Strowman is a lot better of a worker than people give him credit for, because as we know, he was the guy probably carrying this match with Omos. So, I mean, the stuff with Ali, I wonder if it's a work or not. I'm assuming it isn't because of Ali's recent history of being very vocal on social media, of not being happy with his stature in the company. But I think that this was a cool match to see that, like, yeah, you don't always have to be the same type of match all the time. Yeah, and I'm a bit split on uh, on this whole thing, as you described it, because I understand what Braun Strowman is saying because I think as fans we have been conditioned to believe that a five-star match has now been defined in 2022 as a flip-flop fly barely any selling 100 miles an hour who can do the crazy reversals who can who can perform basically like ricochet and um, I I think that there is a downside to that because it does marginalize uh, guys like Braun Strowman and put them to the side and and you when you look at a match if you if you just basically um, put a put a vote out to fans. I think they would think that matches like a Ricochet, like an Ali, like a Dolph Ziggler, like, you know, um, oh, God, I don't even know, uh, Austin Theory, guys like that, you would, most fans would think that they can put on, quote, unquote, better matches. But better matches is a subjective thing, and it evolves over time. And it has evolved now, especially over the last 10 years, into that is a five-star match, not Braun Strowman and Omas. But if you look back, look back even 15, 20 years, like this type of style was more the exception than the rule, if it even existed at all. And it was a much slower paced, like Austin and Triple H. I loved their rivalry back in the day. Austin Rock, for God's sakes. And you look at any of them, they didn't do any high flying moves at all. And yet we would define them as five star matches back in the day. So you don't need to have that kind of stuff. But again, it's a subjective thing that evolves over time. And I understand that. But to Braun Strowman's point, I I mean, he was taking shots at the little guys saying, can you believe we got a 47 star match? And he said, I'm reading it now, reminded the people that no one cares about all these floppy floppers. That's what he called them. Giants and monsters, quote unquote, are greater than flippy flippers. Bag your groceries at Kroger. I mean, so he's taking shots at the smaller guys saying we can still put on five star matches. Now, it was an unprovoked attack on the rest of the roster. So he's got what's coming to him from everybody else. I don't blame Ali for firing back. I don't think it's a work. I think it's something that he genuinely felt was offensive to the rest of the roster that performs at a different level and a different style than they do. But I I really don't have any problem with the way Omas and Braun Strowman uh, worked. And actually, I'd like smaller guys to work a little bit like that. Everybody doesn't need to have that same feel to the match. So many matches today just feel the same, even though it's just different faces. So I, I... don't mind this type of a match with Omos and Strowman. Do I feel like it's a five-star match, even with that the, the lens uh, shifted? No, I don't think it was a five-star match. I think it was a good match, and again, as good as it could have been, but it just comes down to defining how people look at five-star matches today. 
Yeah, and I think it's because the indie style of wrestling has become a lot more popular. And, you know, if you look at AEW, which I think is a very niche style of wrestling, you see what a lot of people define as like a five star match. And look, I'm not a big AEW guy, but it doesn't seem like they have a lot of these big men in that company. Like I, off the top of my head, I know that there's this guy Luchasaurus or Brian Cage, but I don't even know how prominent they are in the product nowadays. But I'm just, it just seems that a lot of people don't have an appreciation for the, these types of matches. And I've always thought that when you have two big guys go against one another and it works to this capacity, it really is a cool thing. And it does really kind of feel like a spectacle. And it's things that kind of stand the test of time in a lot of ways. Like people still talk about the body slab match of Andre the Giant versus Big John Stud. Like I still do thoroughly believe that there's a place in wrestling for these types of matches, but the guys need to be able to work. And I think that Braun Strowman, I think, has always more or less been able to put on a decent match. He's obviously gotten a lot better, especially with the shape he's put himself into. Omos, obviously still a work in progress. I still think his facial expressions, like he's gotten rid of the smile, which is good. That's a very good step. He's gotten rid of the subtle smile. But he, as you point out, the the defaulting to roaring all the oh, time, obviously. I do. One thing I will say about him is that he seems to be more vocal in the match, like talking trash, which yep. is good. That I do like, but yeah, the roaring is a bit like, okay, come on, man. What are you, Barney the Dinosaur? Yeah, like, yeah. come on, just it, stop. It. Yeah, it's, it's too much, yeah. yeah. And, and I get what he's trying to do. I understand that he's trying to play to his role, but I think it's just going back to the well a little too much. Yeah, it's, it, it is. It's just too much. And um, you know, he'll, that kind of stuff he'll learn, and I'm sure... He's being pulled aside and given advice from the, the, the old vets. I'm sure he is, and I, I hope he is. And I'm sure Braun Strowman helped coach him before the match and things to, to look out for and little things to get the crowd involved, and that's great. I, I would hope that's going on. I would imagine it's going on. So, yeah, but Omas has got a long way to go before we can say he's next in line for Roman Reigns' championship. I mean, he's got, he's got a ways to go. He's got the size. He's got the charisma. And he, I mean, he commands your attention when he's on your screen, and that's something you, you can't teach. It's something that either – oftentimes you have or you don't and omas has that that whole it thing but it's it's a long ways before he i think he'd feel comfortable and the company would feel comfortable making him an actual championship contender much less putting the belt on him but uh, yeah i mean i think that when you look at his size i can't remember somebody of his size doing as well in the ring as he has i mean i look back to like kevin nash or something like that i mean how limited they were in the ring or, you know, the great Kali or somebody though that big. And this Omas to me is head and shoulders, no pun intended, above everyone else of that size. When you look at the top of the top guys, the biggest, tallest guys that have ever been in the business, Omas is up there. <laughs> and I think he has claimed the throne of being the most quote unquote athletic in that group. So, I mean, I really appreciate everything that he's clearly putting in the work. He's not just trying to work s slow and very limited in terms of moveset. He's trying everything he can. And I appreciate that. It's clear that he's putting in the work and uh, eventually I think he'll get to a championship match. It just, he's got a lot of mic work to go still some in ring ability, uh, still some in ring work. And uh, I, I think he's getting there. Maybe he's like halfway there for a championship, a championship contending character but um all right well yeah so any final thoughts on crown jewel or braun Strowman omas no i think that all in all it was just a very solid pay-per-view and like you said i think b plus is a very fair grade for him definitely definitely I, i'm with you on a b plus and i'm sure next week we'll have much more considering that survivor series is on the uh, september she's november 26th so that's 19 days away it doesn't give wwe a whole lot of time to uh, come up with what the War Games event's going to be. And then after that, guys, and really after Survivor Series, we're on to WrestleMania season because there's no pay-per-view in December. So after that, we can all start talking about WrestleMania, which is just insane that it's already about here. It's around the corner. So, all right. Well, guys, don't forget to check out Anthony DeMarco and his uh, retro show that he drops every single Friday. And this past week, you did WrestleMania 22, correct? Yeah, I, you know, I dropped a bit of an Easter egg last week saying that it was a very underrated WrestleMania that we would be that I would be covering. And I do think that WrestleMania 22 is one that isn't talked about a whole lot, especially the main event of Triple H versus John Cena, where I think it was the first time that John Cena legitimately got booed out of the building. And, you know, you have HBK versus um, uh, Vince McMahon. You have the triple threat match where with Rey Mysterio winning his first ever World Heavyweight Championship. And just all in all, a very solid WrestleMania that I don't think a lot of people talk about. 
I agree. Yeah, it's one that's overlooked, and I actually always I always think about the Shawn Michaels Vince McMahon build. I mean, that was one of the to me. I know it wasn't the best match in the world, nor was it booked to be, but I I think that Shawn Michaels Vince McMahon match is an underrated match, an underrated build, one of the better builds um, in terms of heel heat. I mean that that I mean there was like a three month period where Shawn every week was getting one upped by Vince, and it was just they made you want to pay for WrestleMania that eighty bucks or whatever it was at the time to see Shawn kick Vince McMahon's face off. So um, anyway, yeah, guys, go check that out. I really would uh, encourage it. And uh, Anthony, we will be talking next week as we get closer and closer to Survivor Series. Yeah, man. Looking forward to it. All right. Have a good night. Stay easy. Bye. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to WWEpodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.